My name is Carolyn Delaney. I'm the founder and CEO here at Journey Enterprises. We're a media company on a mission to make recovery from addiction visible because it's important. It saves lives. There are 20, over 26 million of us in recovery, and we want those who are still sick and suffering to know that there's a path for them. There's millions of us here on the other side of active addiction, and that it's probable that people can and do recover. Our videos share personal intimate stories of what people's journeys were like, going from what it was like to what happened to what it's like now. Um, in an effort to let people know that we're here, we care, and that there's a way out. Visible recovery saves lives, and we want the world to know that. So if you have a story about recovery and would like to share it, uh, please contact me, carolyn at recovery-journey.com. I hope you enjoy our videos. Have a great day. I grew up in a small town in northern Maine. Um, growing up in a small town is is a big part of my story, and I and I often like to start when I'm sharing about coming from a small town. And I remember very clearly as a young girl, not feeling a part of where I was, not feeling a part of my own skin and my own body, and not feeling not feeling comfortable. So in a small town, I felt very out of place. And partly that is, you know, things going on in my own head, but it also is um, feeling like there was something more for me in the world, bigger. Um, so my, my disease really kind of started with feeling really uncomfortable, right? And so much of that is that I wasn't who I was meant to be, even as a young girl. Feelings of needing to please and to be validated and to be something I wasn't. And I was seeking relief and comfort from a very young age. I didn't, I didn't understand that, I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I was very uncomfortable. And I needed relief somewhere, even as a young girl. I remember even as young as eight, feeling anger and sadness and not understanding feelings and not, not having the environment to process feelings as a young girl. Um, so I moved away very quickly when I had the opportunity, very quickly, and that all of the discomfort and unease that I was experiencing, I didn't understand that there was other people in the world that experienced it. You know, I suffered it alone very much. And um, that's why I really think that it is important to share our stories in a, a way to to break the stigma of what addiction is that was so painful to me the nightmare of trying to control my need to seek relief and the shame and the guilt that came along with that um you know i i hope that we share these stories so that the person suffering knows that they don't have to do it alone, right? Because for so long I thought I had to do it alone and I had to figure it out. Um, so I moved a lot to seek relief really quickly. Um, and you know, I, I sought places where I could drink and use like I wanted to. I surrounded myself in situations where I could drink until 4 a.m. I, I created this life where no one was holding me accountable. I lived in uh, South Korea for, for eight years teaching English. And South Korea in Seoul is, is a place where, you know, you can drink on a Tuesday night until 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. 
it's a place where it, it's uh, woven into the fabric of society in a way that I hadn't experienced before. And it was a lot of fun. And it's really important for me to kind of talk about the confusion of what addiction meant for me because it was, uh, you know, I, I wore the red lipstick and high heels really well. I thought I was fooling people and I thought I had it figured out. In reality, it was not, that's not the case. I don't think I realized it at the time, but I desperately wanted someone to hold me accountable, right? I was really lonely and I was in a lot of pain, but I also was having a lot of fun. Me and I was surrounded in this environment by people that were drinking along with me, were drinking a lot, and, but somehow, my my drinking was another level and it, it i started to realize that i was drinking differently um so it was really confusing because i could justify it in my mind because i had acquaintances and people around me that were drinking in a way that was similar but i was always the one that would need that extra bit when i got home it's a progressive disease and i could watch myself progressing and it got a little scarier, little scarier, little scarier. And more and more I allowed um, the dangerous situations that I put myself in became more acceptable. Little by little, I didn't know how to make friends. I didn't know how to make connections without some sort of relief or some sort of substance. I was going to graduate school in London and um, it progressed to a point where I was, it was way out of my control and drugs became a very, um, a very important part of my story and that's what kind of uh, brought me to the place of desperation for help. And it was also one individual holding me accountable and I, I needed to hear that, that, that the world was seeing. Um, so I, I, I found a solution in London and I found a 12-step program and I started to hear um, other men and women and people talking about their experience and I didn't feel so alone and that was huge for me because I'd been suffering alone and trying to figure it out and trying to control it for so long and that's all I could do for a long time was just listen. Um, but that was enough that I could just listen. And um, I've learned that recovery is progressive as well. As the years move forward, things get easier and things get lighter and new experiences are presented. And it's, it's um, so unexpected and so beautiful. I'm thinking about the viewer who may be watching your video and really feeling the grips of that isolation, that loneliness, and um, hearing in your story that connection is a solution, um, what specific recommendations would you make for that new person around connection, around addressing their loneliness and their isolation? We're not so unique, right? A lot of our feelings and experiences, we feel like we're the only one in the world that's experienced them. We're all human beings. We're all human beings that kind of experience a range of emotions um, in very similar ways. Uh, and connection is, as an addict and an alcoholic, uh, connection is really hard for me. I have to work at it um, because it doesn't come instinctively to me. I would say that you don't have to fix it all today, right? Progress comes in, it comes in little steps and little movements forward. So I do a little something today and it gets a little easier tomorrow. Um, just call one person today. Just do one thing differently today, um, and, and it gets it gets easier. And we have to start like my, we we talk about like micro habits, right? Little tiny habits. It's the same with connection too. Making friends does not come easily to me. I have to to make um, you know I have to commit to like just calling one person today when I'm feeling that unease and discomfort, and it gets easier. It's easier. When you think about your uh, recovery progression, where are the sources of support that you would consider the most important to, on your journey? 
yeah, that changes kind of month to month and year to year, it, it, which has been really beautiful that it, it evolves. Uh, today, it looks like calling a sponsor daily and I uh, work a very rigorous writing program. I, I write in the mornings. Building spiritual practice is really important without expectation, right? just kind of showing up and um, uh, exercise is really important to me. Having a community in, in my um, exercise community um, is really important and um, focusing on food and nutrition and taking care of my body is very important for my journey. Just doing little things like that, like reaching out to friends or taking care of body and um, Certainly, I, I go to meetings and I work a 12-step program. It's just so ingrained in, in all of my life now. What your aspirations were for yourself when you were in active addiction and alcoholism and how they're the same or how they may have evolved since then. So I'm, I'm an artist, I'm a theater director, and when um, it's it was very destructive for me when I was using and drinking. I needed that external validation. I needed, and there was a whole lot of people pleasing and there's a whole lot of pain that came with that. Today, that looks much more gentle. It's very, I'm, I'm learning to kind of um, peel away the layers and, and uh, learn how to be a an artist that plays and creates and my goals are to be present with um, as an artist and that looks like a lot of play and creativity um, it certainly looks like not needing to please everyone on the entire planet anymore i i built a strength where i i feel uh, like i can take care of myself first and i can honor my desires in a way i didn't know was possible when i was drinking and using um, so my goals feel a lot quieter now and a lot more internal peace and serenity and joy in my home is the goal now i certainly still have those goals of a creative career hopefully as i'm working towards it i wonder is there any one last um, piece of wisdom that you would want to share. There's so much joy and peace to be found that we're not even able to see when we're in the throes of addiction. And we have such a higher purpose that we're not able to see. And we can recover from no matter where we are or what the situations are, recovery is possible. So my name is Elizabeth and I'm calling in from a barrier island off of the coast of exotic New Jersey. Um, I live on Long Beach Island and I am in New Jersey. I am 52 years old. I have now been in recovery um, for a solid 28 years. I quit drinking at the age of 24. I became an addictive drinker. Um, and drinking always led to other things. So I, you know, I had an amazing therapist early on that said, you know, you don't have to identify yourself as um, an alcoholic or an addict, but you can identify yourself as somebody who's in recovery from um, the misuse of those things. So I'm a firm believer that my using really stemmed from trauma and an inability to deal with that trauma and not being given any tools to deal with it. So I'm okay with calling myself an alcoholic. I'm okay, but I, I don't know that that's how I identify myself wholly. Um, I identify as somebody in recovery and I don't drink. That's so beautiful. I started drinking at a very young age. Um, I guess probably the first time I got really intoxicated was probably at the age of 15, maybe even younger. Um, it was, you know, a time, I grew up in a family that drank. Um, drinking was, was just the way it was. We all did it. Um, I was introduced to it long before I even had a problem. Um, I had parents that drank heavily. Um, they were somewhat functional.
we drink because, or we use drugs, because I have that in my story as well, but we do it because it works. It works until it doesn't work. So that's why I, and that's, I believe that's why I drank. Do I also think there's a gene? Perhaps. Am I able to prove that? No. So do I really overly concern myself with that? I don't. But I have, you know, if I'm going to take a guess, then absolutely there's a gene um, that I was probably born with. Because when I picked up and it worked so well, um, it wasn't something I ever wanted to put down. And then even when I started my own recovery process, um, I couldn't put it down on my own. Through all these years of my recovery, I've seen people who can. They get their recovery going, they get a process going through whatever works for them, and they just stop drinking like that. And um, that was just not possible for me. I had the good girl, bad girl syndrome. So I was a really good girl because I got the grades, I got into the college I wanted to go to, I, you know, forgive me, it was the 80s, but I was, you know, on the cheerleading squad and, you know, all kinds of like extracurricular activities so that I looked good on the outside because I didn't want anyone to think something was wrong with me. And then, you know, come nightfall or any opportunity that I had, um, again, starting in high school and through college, I was off the rails. I was just a blackout drinker. I was at times violent. Um, I got arrested. I spent uh, a little bit of time in jail. If I didn't drink all day, which is something I didn't do, I was in pain. And so I started counseling. I started working with a therapist. I also removed myself from the South and I moved to New York City immediately upon graduating from college. I got myself to Manhattan. I got a therapist, but I continued the good girl, bad girl thing. And I got to the point where I was so disgusted with my behavior and thank God I was in therapy that my therapist said, you know, she was like, did you ever think maybe you have a drinking problem? And I was like, kind of thought everybody blacked out. I literally was ignorant. I did not know. I did not know that wasn't normal. She said, have you ever checked out a meeting? They have A meetings and I didn't even know what that was. Never heard of it. I mean, we're talking like on some level, I was clueless about health. I just knew that I didn't want to end up in the situations I had been ending up, which was waking up places that I didn't know and I didn't know how I got there. I went to my first meeting. It was downtown in Soho. I walked into the basement and there were probably 150 young people there. And I was just shocked. And I'm like, who are these people? It was every kind of person that I would want to drink with. Every kind of person that I would want to party with. Um, and my first, the, this punk rocker girl, came up to me, I mean, she was such a badass. She came up to me and she's like, you know, she was like, oh, it's your first day. And you know how people in, in 12 step programs are usually pretty friendly to the newcomer. So I was getting a lot of that. And that really also threw me because I had never, no one, I, I just hadn't experienced people being that open and kind. My experience of getting sober in Manhattan was the most exhilarating, exciting, brilliant time I ever had in my life. And the community was so strong. So, you know, every time we got together, we would then go out and have fun and literally have fun. The meetings were great, but it wasn't that that kept me sober. It was the community and the friendships and the, the interesting people and the famous people that walked into the rooms and you know the rock stars that I sat next to. That was something I feel super blessed to have experienced. And I never ever drank again. I mean a day at a time. So and those people are still my friends. We worked on our emotional sobriety. Um, my first sponsor said you know wear your recovery like a loose garment. Just don't drink, don't do drugs. 
do whatever else you need to do. Be, be as safe as you can, but have fun because that will keep you coming back. And so I have carried that with me these 28 years. Um, I've never stopped having fun. Um, and I try to help people find recovery, sustain recovery through the hard work that needs to be done. I don't do anything alone ever. You know, I built a business that once I got sober a couple years in, you know, we're super ambitious. Our alcohol and drugs is, is such a testament to what's possible for us. When we're so hungry to get obliviated and we figure out how to do that, if we transfer that hunger to something constructive, like literally, the world is our oyster. Uh, how, how do you have fun in recovery today? Well, I'm not 24, I'm not 27, I'm not 30. Um, and every, you know, every chunk of time, fun was different, right? For those periods of time. Um, fun for me now is, <laughs> is the, you know, I, is being home with my family. You know, fun for me now is really understanding and immersing myself in the stability and the comfortable, cozy life that I've created. Um, I have a 10 year old son. I didn't have my first child till I was 42. Um, I didn't get married until, you know, we got married a few months before we had the baby. <laughs> um, I hadn't met my partner, my, my husband, um, until I was, I hadn't met him until I was 40. We stand up paddleboard and we surf and we swim like fish, um, you know, weather permitting. I, I love swimming. I love the water. The other thing I really love is I have fun with friends. You know, for me, having a good laugh with a friend um, on the phone or in person, whatever I have to do to connect and sort of be with them, um, I just, I have a great time doing it. Um, I mean, those, those are a few of the ways I have fun now. I really, had I continued down that path, I would probably have died of an overdose. I mean, and I was so sad and so depressed and I'm the opposite of that now. And I'm the go-to person in my community for people who need help. So I have fun sharing my story and giving hope to people that have none, you know? Or even if I don't give hope, I, I enjoy being the person that can listen. You know, I never felt seen and heard. I never felt seen and heard until I was seen and heard. And so I don't take that lightly, but I do truly believe that connection is the opposite of addiction. And if we can, you know, hold that space for someone, then they, they, you know, I can only speak for myself. Then I felt connected and I didn't want to be addicted. Is there anything else that you would want to say to that potential um, viewer? The reason I would drink again or the reason I would use again was always fear-based was always because of some fear. And what I have learned over these years is that fear is a huge liar. It's a lie. So if there's one mantra I would I would put up on my wall, it's fear is a liar.